Greetings and welcome to In-Depth on DK Rostar. Now, issues of agriculture, food security, and how we build capacity in those areas are current topics of debate. Desiree Johnson Phillips, she is a farmer and managing director at Leading Seedlings and Exotic Plants in Karapi, Chaima. And she joins us to discuss the theme, Skilling or Female Farming, as we tackle food insecurity in Trinidad and Tobago. Welcome, Desiree. How are you doing? Thank you so much, TK, for having me. It's such a pleasure to be here today. The pleasure is always. Now, there's a saying, uh, uh, let your food be your medicine and your medicine be your food. Uh, it seems as though you really kind of took that to heart because you had other plans in mind in terms of career choices. Take us a little bit into how it is you got into farming, please. Well, it's really ironic, actually, because... Growing up, I wanted to be a, a doctor. You know, this was what my family and I had planned for my life, you know, but uh, my grandfather was a farmer for many years and, uh, you know, it was a great hobby of mine. But back in 2021, after the passing of my son, Deshaun, um, I used farming and agriculture as a therapeutic form of healing. And it was through this that this hobby grew into a passion that, I myself couldn't contain, and therefore I started my business leading seedling and exotic plants, you know? And what, what was this about, and condolences, even, uh, even though this amount of time has passed, because that's something that never necessarily leaves you. But what is it, can you kind of quantify or what was that specific thing that was so therapeutic about farming, about seeing things rise from the, seeing the work of your hands? Well, um, I'm really appreciative of that question, actually, because what makes farming therapeutic is the process. You start with a small seed and the seed you plant it and seeing that growth and development, you know, you're loving and you're nurturing this thing. And, and when you get to that point where you're able to harvest it, uh, you enjoy the freshness, the, the nourishment of what you did, you know, it, it's, it's, it's healthy. The nutrition is, is far beyond anything else. And I think for me, what really connected me was the ability to see that growth and development. You know, that growth and development, I didn't necessarily get to see in my child, but being able to love something as though it was him, it just connected us, you know, and I, 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 can't, I can't look back now. These things are your babies as well, because I remember having a conversation with somebody and we were saying it's totally natural. We talk to our plants, we talk to the things that we grow, and it seems natural to us. And there were some people who say, but, mm, but, <laughs> and even looking at the changes within you, like I, there's a term that I got from Omar Dath Maharaj, yardening. So in mm -hmm. terms of like, yes, in the yard and the deal, and being barefoot in the yard, I think is very important to me as an individual after we take off this jacket and tie and these kind of things. But it's <laughs> one thing to say, okay, well, you're moving from a hobby and that hobby becoming therapy and a passion. But what of the response of the persons, the people in your space who you all already decide that you're going to have this doctor in, in the family? What was their, what was their um, response to this move? I think, um, well, my family and my friends in particular are generally really supportive all around. And I think I'm very fortunate for that, to have a team, uh, that support team around me. I think when I told them that, you know, listen, I'm going to be getting into agriculture as a profession, they were probably like, okay, maybe this is just a phase. She's just going through something that's a bit difficult, you know, would be difficult on anybody. But uh, thus far, looking at me, you know, they're the ones that are there by my side. They're the ones helping me supporting me in more ways than, than one, you know, it's not only about them just being there, but sometimes it's all about investment, about growth, about development, and they are the people who have been helping me to push along, and I am totally appreciative for that. And looking at that growth and development, and I'm happy to hear that, but looking at that growth and development, do you farm, do you treat, do you treat with these seedlings or the, the, the things that you are growing in the same way that your grandfather would have? or have some things changed in terms of methods of agriculture? Uh, what is that process like? Well, my grandfather was a traditional farmer. 
So he did everything in ground. And you know, we would have utilized those traditional forms of farming and using manual, uh, these type of stuff. Today, what I do is that I do more hydroponic farming. And aside from hydroponic farming, at Leading Seedlings on Exotic Plants, we also design and we build hydroponic systems. And you know, there are so many different types of hydroponic systems because hydroponics is the process of growing food um, in a soilless nutrient-based solution. So what this means is that there are so many different ways you can do it, whether vertical, whether horizontal, or even using bucket systems. So even though we do both traditional and uh, what I like to call 21st century farming, uh, we, we try to show people that, you know, depending on your space or what area you're using, that both of them are very viable options because at the end of the day, what we're trying to curb is food insecurity. No, I he it seems as though, from what I'm hearing, is there a consult consultative aspect to what it is you do? And that could that could be, a, well, I see you nodding here, so you'll tell me about that as well. But you also said that there's so many systems, and that brings me back to moving from a hobby to a profession uh, or having it evolve, mm -hmm. So that and that passion still being there. But what are some of the steps that you would have used to say, okay, well, this is what I'm going to do? How did you decide, okay, well, this is the type of hydroponic system that I'm going to use? And what are some of those possibly even challenges along that entrepreneurial journey. Long, long, long. So you could just break up as we go and we'll deal with everything. Okay, no problem. Well, let's talk about the challenges because I mean, there are challenges in everything we do. Uh, challenges could be in personal life or it can just be in business life. I think for me, with respect to my challenges, with, with respect to my business, it's really been the fact that I'm so passionate about agriculture and the curbing of food insecurity I find myself um, addressing clients at any point in time. So if I get a phone call or even a message at 11 in the night, there I am responding because, you know, at the end of the day, the end goal is to, to educate people on how we can, as a, as a nation, as a community, grow our own nutritious food to feed ourselves and by extension, our neighbors. Or everybody can get involved and maybe we can all access that nutritious food. But, you know, with respect to what you're asking about the different types of systems, I mean, there is a lot of innovation and a lot of stuff going on worldwide with respect to agriculture. We have the addition of lots of technology in the, in with respect to like machinery and different hydroponic systems. We find that aeroponic towers are something that are now coming into the market in Trinidad and Tobago, but something that we are looking at at leading seedlings and exotic plants is the is smart farming. What we're trying to do um, as we speak right now is that we're trying to develop maybe an application where we would be able to connect these whether traditional or 21st century farming technologies to an app that can help anybody, not just a farmer, but a home gardener, somebody who's doing this a hobby, connect any of them to this app so that they would be able to, 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 to be able to um, develop their system properly, make sure they're doing the right thing. Okay, I have this pest on my plant. What should I do? How would I go about it? And, you know, this is something that's going to take some time. We're currently in the works of it, but I hope that, you know, in the near future, that it's something that we'll be able to release. Okay, and in the two minutes that we have inside this half of the conversation, uh, how does someone reach out to you to say, okay, well, I have this space in my yard and I'm thinking of getting into hydroponic farming or having a hydroponic system installed. Take me through that process, thank you. Okay, so leading seedlings on exotic plants can be contacted at 472-4040 or 740-4892. And we're on all social media platforms at LSEP868. So if anybody wants to reach out to us, you can also email us at LSEP868 at gmail.com. And, you know, we are always ready and willing to give any advice on, you know, any space that you have and, and what you can do in that space.
So we continue this conversation because there's so many other things that you're doing to increase capacity, not just within yourself, but uh, increasing the theoretical knowledge and that capability competence. So we get into that when we reach in. We're speaking with the managing director of leading seedlings and exotic plants, Ms. Desiree John Phillips. Stay with us. Welcome back. We are speaking with Desiree Johnson. Philip, we are finding out about what she is doing uh, to help address insecurity in Trinidad and Tobago. And you recently completed the American Women in Entrepreneurship Program. Why? What is it that appealed to you about it? And what was that process like? Okay, thank you again. Um, well, actually, it's not the American Woman. It's the Academy for Women Entrepreneurs. And well, actually, at the time when I got into it, the reason what, what, well, what attracted me to it was the fact that I'm very new to entrepreneurship, and I wanted to be able to use a program that would help me develop these entrepreneurial skills. And to be quite honest, the program, which is offered via the U.S. Embassy, has been really excellent. It afforded myself and about 37 other women the opportunity to not only develop our businesses, but general business skills such as financials, um, management, employee training, and how to train with them, how to deal with the training of employees. Um, at the end of it, you know, we were afforded pitch training, which there was a pitch competition, and I pitched for the first time ever in my life, and I was able to win the second place of that competition, and so I'm really appreciative of that. And this is this is something that I hear from more than one person because it's one thing to say, okay, well, this is my hobby, this is my job, this is my profession. I enjoy doing it, and I am focused so much into it. But then realizing, okay, well, another part of this job that I like is having people know that I exist. I offer these services, and you can come to me as an entrepreneur for me to fulfill whatever of re requirements that you have. What has been the biggest, you said entrepreneurship is new to you. What's been yeah. the biggest challenge thus far? Wow, that's a real interesting question. Um, challenges with respect to entrepreneurship has just been, for me, about the newness. There are so many things that I recognize via the program, via the U.S. Embassy, that I have to learn. And I'm so fortunate that I was able to learn that. For instance, you know, with respect to financial management and how we would go about doing that, I have I don't have a background in accounts. You know, my background, as I told you before, I I was I wanted to be a doctor. So you know, I'd been doing my degree in biochemistry and biology at the University of the West Indies, and my accounts there is there was absolutely no training with respect to that. So. You know, for me, that would have been my biggest challenge. And being a part of this program would have assisted me in, in you know, curbing that, the fears of doing that and teaching me how to go about it. Oh, Ms. Desiree, you just sent me down a rabbit hole and I'm very happy to follow it in the sense that we recently spoke with someone who is now involved in spirit industry. He started mm -hmm. off as a chemical engineer. I <laughs> don't think that you ever just totally throw something to decide. So mm -hmm. in terms of that biology and biochemistry, do you see that playing a role in what it is you do and how it is you do it? Well, it's actually funny. When I was doing my degree, I tend to, I, I, I try to stay away from the plant biology part of things. And, you know, it's quite ironic because I was talking to some friends about it. I was like, you know, it's, it's hilarious that I try to stay away from plant biology, yet here I am in a field that, that I'm doing it. Um, but it's important to know that biology and biochemistry and science in the, on the whole is really important in agriculture. And a lot of people believe that it's just about, you know, you're putting a plant in the ground, but understanding that science behind it, you know, the fact that nitrogen is important, phosphorus is important, all these chemicals and these elements are important. You know, it helps you to get a better product at the end of the day and get a healthier product to be able to give to consumers. 
and you say that and two things come to mind one the story of the the three sisters and in terms of what it is you plan together i think now people call it centropic farming where mm -hmm. you would put man, and even if you go like corpus christi would have just passed yes. and normally i grew up you just put that cutlass in your shoop, you lean into the side you put a corn or you put a few corn and a few i want to say gumbo pigeon peas inside <laughs> the same hole because the, the, the pigeon peas is a nitrogen fixer and the corn just mm -hmm. gobbles up that nitrogen. So have them working together so you're able to plant them closely. Uh, looking at the fact that, and this is a gentleman who was recently awarded, got a national award for his work in agriculture and the way that he would have been putting and improving the stock, I think of, of sweet potatoes specifically, and looking and seeing what works, how it happens, as opposed to just say, like you're saying, okay, well, you put it in the ground and you harvest it. You put it in the mm -hmm. ground and you harvest it. Getting things better. Uh, are there any things that you see as they are right now when you say, I want to work on that? I want it to be a little different, be it color, be it taste, be it shape. And, and, and does this, even though it wasn't necessarily plant chemistry and stuff, but the biology and the biochemistry, you see yourself working towards anything like that? Well, to be quite honest, my goal actually after this is to, to get into my master's. I really want to study tissue culture to be able to help. I mean, we just came out of a pandemic, you know, and via the pandemic, we had a lot of issues with respect to getting seeds and fertilizers. So my end goal is to be able to do my master's, possibly even my PhD in tissue culture, which will help me to be able to develop my own type of plants and and seeds so that we can have our own our own bank here in Trinidad and Tobago, our own, you know, that we will have to really reach out to other countries to be able to get stuff in, in that regard. You know, we need to be more self-sustaining when it comes to agriculture and we do have the capacity to do it. So why not take the mantle and try to get it done? And I'm really excited having this conversation with you. And because I think sometimes people say that you can't do this, like Porkins Douglas says one of those words with the R on the end of it, doctor, lawyer. So yeah, go and, go and do that. One plan, to go on this. <laughs> and I think this conversation we have is, will be one of those things to help dispel that myth, dispel that notion. But speak to the person who was saying, Farming is just one sort of thing, and I don't think I'm interested in it. In terms of like the traditional farming that your grandfather would have been involved in, uh, give uh, a little idea about the breadth of and poss of possibilities that you see in farming and agri entrepreneurship from where you are currently operating. First, okay. So there was something that my mother and my grandmother always told us when we were growing up. That is growth and comfort don't coexist. So in everything that we do, there's going to be some level of difficulty in it. But we need to not look at that difficulty as a way to run, but look at it as a way of being able to, to develop something. So the reason why I, tend, I, I moved away from the traditional farming, a little, not much, was because I found that there are some practices that we must do in traditional farming that in some hydroponic or 21st century farming technologies, you don't have to do. So for instance, um, in good, with using good agricultural practices, there is something called weed management. And weed management is something that a lot of young people, in particular young farmers coming up, tend to shy away from or run away from simply because there's a notion of it being difficult. Hydroponic farming, for instance, minimizes the amount of weeding we have to do because we no longer have that soil aspect to deal with. And so I say this to say that even though at times things may appear to be difficult, we can all impact and develop, be innovative, make different ways of making things easier for ourselves. I actually had a conversation this week with someone talking about the fact that, you know, listen, Hydroponic farming is, is hard, just the same way as traditional farming. But is it about being easy or is it about us doing it right, getting that end product? Isn't that what we're aiming for? So yes, I think it's a bit easier, but easy in general, no. And I think we need to look away from things being easier and just try and look at what you gain from it. That, that, and that's what I did. And that's why 
loving and nurturing those plants come so easy to me, you know? And putting yourself out there, looking at opportunities and reaching for them with both hands, apparently, is something that you're no stranger to. And it, because I'm seeing that you're also a participant of the Youth Agricultural Homestead Program, <laughs> yeah. How is that going? Because that is something that was oversubscribed. <laughs> I wanted to go back in time so that I'd be young <laughs> enough to apply. But um, tell me a little bit about that. Thank you. Well, to be quite honest, I actually applied to the YAP program when the first um, subscription of it came out and I didn't get you. And I'm going to be honest, I was completely distraught. You know, I looked at it like at that time, like, oh my goodness, maybe this is not what is in the cards to me. Maybe this is not what God wants to me. And, you know, someone told me, listen, do not use that failure as saying, you know, this is not for you. Try again. And and I don't know why I didn't remember it at the time. You know, it's like, you don't stop just once, continue trying. It's something is for you. It's for you. And I applied again. I got through the part-time program. And thus far, it has been amazing. You know, the classes that we're doing is definitely stuff that, or things that are going to help when you get there on those farms to be able to develop both crop production, livestock production. Um, and I can't complain. It's also a, a great hub for networking because these are other young upcoming agripreneurs, as they like to say, you know, that, that, that I'm getting to socialize with, that I'm getting to know. And I think this is an excellent avenue for us to be able to push food security in Trinidad and Tobago, the region and globally, you know, what we need to do is involve the young people. And I'm just grateful for the opportunity. And I think I I just want to leave uh, a minute for you to wrap up in terms of like any closing statements. And no, I also see, okay, well, yes, the name of it is Leading Seedlings and Exotic Plants, but I'm not sure what exotic plants or what it is exactly <laughs> dealing with. So we let, let us promote the thing too as, as, we, as we close it up. Okay, so thank you so much for this opportunity again. Um, and just to close off, you know, my business, Leading Seedlings and Exotic Plants, we cater to a wide variety of local and exotic produce, such as, uh, such as let's say, bok choy, tak soy, and these are things that are not local to Trinidad and Tobago. We do produce, we do seedlings, we do trees, um, we do plants in buckets and pots, so like pomegranates. Uh, we also do consultations, design and development of a plethora of different hydroponic systems, so whether it be aeroponic towers, DFT, NFT, drift to waste, Dutch bucket systems, you know, we are, we are your people. And um, I really look forward to the opportunity to being able to speak to like-minded people or just people who are just looking to get into agriculture, whether it be a home gardener or a long-time farmer. We are always interested in the conversation and to help the development in this sector. And we have been really blessed to be part of this conversation, Desiree Johnson Philip. And on behalf of the entire TTT News team, this has been in depth with me, DK Rasta. Thank you so much for joining us.